That night, after Esther's dinner, the king couldn't sleep. He ordered the record book, the day-to-day -day journal of events, to be brought in and read to him. As they read through the events, they came across the story of how Mordecai exposed the plot of two guards that were conspiring to assassinate Xerxes. The king stopped them and asked, what was done to honor Mordecai? When he discovered that nothing had been done, he asked his servants, who's left in the court? It just so happened that Haman was waiting there to ask the king's permission to hang Mordecai. Xerxes immediately had him brought in and before Haman could say a word, asked, what should be done for the man the king delights to honor? Haman thought the king was talking about him, so he spared no expense with his ideas. He proposed the man should be dressed in a robe, a royal robe, one the king had worn. He should be placed on a horse the king has ridden himself and have a crown upon his head. Then he should be led around the city by the most noble prince who should be proclaiming, thus it shall be done to the man whom the king desires to honor. In a response that seems too perfect, the king told Haman to do everything he had just suggested for the Jew, Mordecai. That evening, Mordecai returned to the king's gate and Haman rushed back to his house. He was absolutely mortified and recounted the day's horrors to his wife and friends. While Haman was still lamenting, the king's men arrived and rushed Haman off to Esther's second banquet. Good morning, everyone. You guys doing well? Good. Uh, this is a really fun chapter in our study of the book of Esther, and uh, I, I love uh, where we're getting to go. I, I love stories. Uh, as our kind of venue, chapel, cactus, and Northridge communities join us now, it's great to be together. And uh, being a guy who loves stories, I'm a big movie guy. Uh, some people like music. Uh, some people like reading. I think reading kind of missed my generation. We're going to get back on that track here pretty soon. But uh, I love movies. Uh, my parents are here this morning, and they'll tell you that since I was a little kid, I've had kind of a weird uh, thing that I can do with movies. I have almost a photographic memory when it comes to them. And so I can actually re-see the scenes in my head, and I can remember the lines that were said, and I can kind of emulate the voices and stuff, which is super annoying when you're a 10-year-old kid who's basically regurgitating every movie he's ever seen. So my parents are super patient, but uh, I, I learn a lot through films uh, because they're kind of immersive for uh, the things that gather my attention. I'm a very visual learner. And so one of the things that I've realized is there's certain themes or certain kind of traits within a narrative that really draw my attention. One of the ones that I love is conflict, and it's, I don't think that makes me a sick person. It's just every story has a good conflict in it. At no point have you ever like, watched a story and you go, you know, nothing really bad happened to anyone. It was just awesome, and then you know, we kind of rode off into the sunset. And so one of my favorite stories about conflict is The Count of Monte Cristo. And it's just that fantastic story where the main character, Edmund Dantes, is, uh, is sitting there and he's got this friend, the worst best friend anyone could possibly imagine in Fernand Mondego. And the two of them have this great relationship, but Mondego, who is just this selfish, self-centered individual, longs for Edmund's fiance. And so by the time the story is over, he's imprisoned his friend Edmund in this place called the Chateau d'If, where he's tortured on his uh, anniversary of being there every single year. It's this horrible experience, but at the end, the conflict really comes to this massive culmination where the two are just crossing swords and eventually Fernand loses his life in the battle. It's a great story of conflict. If you've never seen it before, I apologize for ruining it, but you're kind of behind. It's been around for a while, so. Another one I love is I love Justice. And we've talked about this movie a lot. It's an Academy Award-winning film. It's rough, but uh, Jamie showed clips from different sermons of the Shawshank Redemption. The main character, Andy Dufresne, is wrongfully imprisoned for the murder of his wife. As he continues to sit there, kind of year after year, rotting away in Shawshank Prison, uh, he has this warden who's corrupt. He actually gets sucked into the corruption. And in the great reversal of kind of everything that's going on, there's this justice-served moment where he escapes from prison, crawling through 300 yards of just nastiness through a sewer line to come out free on the other side. The picture's great because not only does he escape from prison, but he also ends up notifying the police. They come in to capture the warden at the end of the movie. Now, one of my last and probably my most favorite traits in any great story is irony. 
I think it's so great when there's an ironic or big twist at the end. And one of the ones that uh, we've seen lately is they just recently remade one of my like childhood favorite movies, Aladdin. And don't send me an email on what you thought. I, I don't care what you thought of the remake. I thought it was awesome. But uh, there's this great scene kind of at the end of it. And uh, there's, they're kind of going through this whole thing. And uh, the, the street rat, the thief, kind of finds this lamp. He rubs it. The genie kind of comes out. And he goes, listen, you got three wishes. Pretty standard for genies. And then uh, he says, hey, listen, I would love to be a wealthy prince. Only to find out that the princess who he loves is repulsed by the fact that he's a prince now and by his riches. Irony is so great. And if you like these traits like I do, this chapter of Esther is just a fantastic, fantastic story. We're going to see each of these kind of play its way into the narrative today. And I've kind of said as I've studied this this week, uh, the Lord has kind of been behind the scenes. That's what we called this whole series is God behind the scenes. But if, if God's kind of been like under the water surface, we start to see the shark fin of the Lord coming up pretty clearly in chapter six. And so let's do this. Let's pray as we continue through our study of, the cha- of chapter six of Esther. So Lord, we do, we just ask right now that you would come in, that you would illuminate our hearts as we look at the conflict, the justice and the irony and the work of your hands uh, as you work for your people. Lord, would you just really help us zero in on the places where we can see ourselves in this story? Uh, Narrative is such a great way for us to identify with characters. And when we make that kind of an external experience, we can so many times find places where we can grow because we see it somewhere else. And so God, as we go in to chapter six today, we just ask that you would really open our hearts to places where we can grow, places where we can be encouraged. And Lord, we do this in the safety of your hands in your house. We pray this in your name, amen. Uh, One of the things, and this is probably my, my favorite observation of Esther so far, is we really don't learn from the characters who are having a great day. I don't know if you noticed that, but like when, when Haman's doing great and everything's kind of going his way, we're not focused on Haman, we're focused on Mordecai. And, and, and the same thing today, like Mordecai's having a pretty good day in chapter six. <clears throat> and so that's kind of something that's going great. We're actually gonna focus a little bit on Haman today. We, we don't learn from Esther either. Like, I mean, she's kind of got this crazy deal. The, the moment we focus on is kind of for, for such a time as this, that moment where this young girl who, I mean, if you kind of rewind the story, we tend to glorify it a little bit. I think we look at Esther and we go, I mean, she got to be queen. And it's like, well, or uh, a young girl from a Jewish background was ripped from her home, won the ancient version of The Bachelorette, and then kind of ends up, all week, I've been waiting to say that, so glad you liked it. <laughs> And then she ends up in what we would really identify today as this sexually abusive relationship with a man that she doesn't want to be with. But we learn from her in struggle. We learn from the, in the midst of her pain. And I think that's such a great thing for us to zero in on because that's how we tend to learn. It's not the seasons of our lives where things are just clipping along and going great. Those are those rest seasons. Those are those times where we get filled up. And they do happen in life. But if you look back in the times of your life where you've learned the most with God, it's during times when things are really, really hard. It's during times when there's pain and there's struggle, there's strife and there's suffering. And the Lord is going, I'm still here. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'm by your side through thick and thin. I am the friend you can count on. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today as well. But these first four verses of Esther, you heard the story told in kind of the pre-service video there, which I think our production team is doing a fantastic job with. But these first four verses are, are just so great because we've got three, we'll call them coincidental circumstances, where we just see the Lord kind of working behind the scenes. And the first one is this, the king can't sleep, Okay. Now, what I want you to know about the king not being able to sleep is we, we've got a detail in there. It says that night. So what's happened is some of the details in this story of Esther happen over days, months, even years. Like when the king goes through this whole, hey, we're going to prepare all these women to kind of come in to be presented to me. That was like a year long process based on what we know about the ancient practices. And so there's long periods of time, but now it's like the timeline has slowed and the author is now letting us know, hey, listen, we're going to really focus in because these details are important. So we're coming directly out of the feast, which Kevin had last week. And Kevin joked about it, but I sat there and I kind of watched my buddy preach on a chapter where basically nothing happens. And we sat there and we were away the week before and I'm like, what are you going to do with this? And he's like, I don't know. She basically shows up and goes, hey, we're going to do a feast. And then goes, kind of just kidding, will you come back tomorrow? And then he pulled 40 minutes out of it. And I was like, wow, that's impressive. So, (laughs) and I thought he did a fantastic job. Yeah, you can clap for that. Yeah, so we don't get to pick our chapters. They kind of get assigned to us. So we dive in and we're ready to go. But my friend is gifted. Uh, we come directly out of that banquet and we step into this place where now things are about to really start picking up. But the king can't sleep. 
That's the first thing we see. The Hebrew phrase, which is the language that the Old Testament was originally written in, would read like this if we were to read it literally. It would say, the sleep of the king fled. Now, as we continue to kind of move through the progression of the Bible and how it was written, meaning like translated from kind of language to language, the Hebrew uh, eventually got translated into Greek and it's called the Septuagint. And when it was translated into Greek, listen to this. This is how they translate that phrase. The Lord kept sleep away from the king. Isn't that interesting? You start to hear kind of, oh, okay, so there's this kind of historical progression of where we see God, call it behind the scenes, or coincidence, okay? Now, here's what I want you to hear, too, and this is super cool. In chapter 6 of Daniel, okay, uh, there's King Darius, and Darius has sentenced Daniel to the lion's den. We all remember the felt board when you were in grade, you know, grade school and Sunday school, you had the den and you had the lion. That whole thing happens, and now what you have is you have King Darius who has a sleepless night. Gang, it's the exact same phrase. The exact same phrase is translated in Greek to be able to say, hey, the Lord kept sleep away from the king. Here's what I want you to see, because this is important. God does not need to only work through believers. God can do whatever he wants with whoever he wants because he's the creator of all things. God has been working through pagan kings through the entire story of his people. Whether it's King Darius, whether it's Xerxes from Persia, whether it's go back through the Exodus, Do you guys see God intervening with Egyptian kings back then? The Pharaoh, what's he say? He hardened his heart. So God can work through whoever. It tells us in the scriptures that he makes it to reign on the righteous and the unrighteous. So the Lord can do anything we want. And I want you to see that he's intervening on behalf of his people through a king that has absolutely no interest in him. Second thing we see is he calls for this book of memorandum. Basically, all the things that have been done in the day's account. Time out. This guy has the, just like the resources of an entire country at his disposal, okay? He's not afraid to burden other people for his own pleasure, okay? We've already seen that. But he could have said, hey, take me on a chariot ride around all of the lands and all of the grounds and show me how awesome I am. Let's go take a walk through all of the money that I have, grab some women, bring them to me. I mean, he's already had a drunken party that ended up in his wife needing to dance for him that got her tossed out. So it's like, this guy could do anything he wants and he loves to party. And in the midst of a sleepless night, he calls for a book of events. Like, this is a funky thing to ask for if you are Xerxes, but that's exactly what he does. And here's what I want you to see. The Lord is just kind of put together this tight little channel that Xerxes is so unknowingly walking down, and the Lord is intervening. So it's like the Lord goes, yep, we're not going to sleep tonight. I'm taking sleep away from you. And then directly after that, what happens next? Hey, grab that book. Remember that book? You want that book. You can almost hear the Lord just moving him down this channel. And here's the third thing that happens. Of all the stuff that goes on in that book, Xerxes focuses in on what? Mordecai. Like, presumably, it's a book. Like, it wasn't, hey, bring me the one thing that happened that day. He focuses in on Mordecai out of everything that's happening. And the important part of the first four verses is that you just simply see God is behind the scenes, but he is still very present, very powerful, and moving in the lives of even people who have zero regard for his plan. And and I just love this. The turning point in this whole thing is where we sit there, and now in verse 5 of chapter 6, I kind of say this is really the turning point of the whole narrative. Everything has been kind of quietly going on behind the scenes. But you now have this guy entering the picture, and the way he enters is awesome. It's Haman. Haman has been kind of a pain from the moment he showed up, and he's continuing to just kind of, you can see him building himself this little problem. But the king goes through this point, he hears about Mordecai, he listens to this book, and as he's sitting there, he goes, well, what's been done for this guy Mordecai? It sounds like he saved my life. And they go, yeah, no, he did. And nothing's been done. And so here, this is great. The king goes, well, who's in the court right now? And they go, Haman. Haman's in the court. And as my buddy Kevin Yule would say, perfect. Let's see how that works out. And so it says, the king's young men, here we go, verse five, let's look at it. And the, king, uh, the king's young men told him, Haman is there standing outside the court, and the king said, let him come in. I want you to see how Haman comes into this process, because we have so much to learn from this godless man. Haman comes in. Now, Haman is already all gassed up on his own press releases, because he just sat in his house And his wife, Zeresh, and all of these other individuals have basically sat there and gone, bro, you're killing it. 
You just came from a banquet with the king and his wife. You're doing awesome. You deserve, you deserve, you, are, you should be prideful. You should be entitled. You should go take what is rightfully yours. And so Haman, presumably having had a wine-filled banquet and then going back to his house, in, in the midst of his idiocy goes, you know what? I'm going. So I want you to think about the fact. Remember when Esther sat there and went, if I go to the king unannounced, I could die. Remember that? Okay, Haman's doing the same thing and doesn't seem to be bothered by it at all, which is stupid, okay? So he's standing outside of the king's quarters and he's going, all right, I deserve an audience with the king. And what I want you to see is this. The thing that brings Haman down is he has built this mountain of entitlement and pride that he is now standing on top of and it's actually what ends him. I want you to recognize, this is a great question that I, through the week. I want to kind of us to think about this. How different would the story of Esther be if Haman was a humble man of God? Just think about that. I would argue the festival of Purim wouldn't even exist. That we would sit back now and somewhere along the way, this guy would have gone, whoa. He would have heard the conviction of the Lord and gone, ah, oh, this mountain's getting a little high. Because the reality is he is standing there with all these expectations of what he deserves and it has run him because this is what entitlement does to us. It blinds us. Entitlement blinds human beings from any consequence, from any potential damage we could do to others, from any way that we could look at life and say, ooh, this may not work out well. Entitlement says, that thing out there is mine and I'm gonna go get it. I, I want you to, to look at this. This is something that I think kind of hit me this week. Uh, this is exactly what is true. You never hike down the mountain of pride. You always fall off of it. You always fall off of it. You hike your way up there. Anybody ever gone, oh, I'm kind of prideful. I'm just going to gently back my way down that thing. No, it takes the hammer of the Lord to go, hey, enough. This has to stop because it blinds us. I've heard it said before, selfishness is the only disease that affects, affects everyone but the person who has it. And it's so true. So as we kind of come to this point, we see entitlement's the very thing that has set Haman up for failure. Now, let's take a look at how that works out for him. Nope, this is such a critical part of this story. What I want to do is I want to read it out loud for us because it's just word for word. It's too good not to look at. So Haman walks in and it says this. It says, so Haman came in and the king said to him, what should be done to the man whom the king delights to honor? Perfect setup, totally nebulous. This guy's going to fall right into this trap. It says that Haman said to himself, whom would the king delight to honor more than me? I love that we get the little thought bubble, right? On each of these characters, it's just like, you get the little kind of transparent thought camera and he's just going right into it. Okay, so it says, and Haman said to the, to the king, for the man whom the king delights to honor, let royal robes be brought, which the king has worn, and the horse that the king has ridden, and on whose head a royal crown is set. And let, the robes of, and let the robes and the horse be handed over to the king's most noble officials. Gosh, that's the one that really buries him, isn't it? Let them dress the man whom the king delights to honor and let them lead him on a horse through the square of the city and proclaim before him, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. What? Now here's why this is so ridiculous. Haman is standing there, and I want you to hear this from Xerxes' perspective for just a second. He is standing there and saying, I want your robes. I want your horse. I want your people. What's he saying? I want your job. I want royalty. I deserve it. By the way, I'm here unannounced. You, you know, there wasn't a ticket puller now serving 375. That's me. He's standing there saying, I want your job. I want your position. I want your honor and your praise. And he's so deserving of it that he would stand there before the king and say it directly to the king. Now, some of the commentators kind of allude to the fact that, guys, this is not as coincidental as it may appear. Xerxes does a few things that are very directly aimed at leveling our buddy Haman. And we'll talk about him in just a second. But he's basically sitting there, and what we don't realize is that it's Haman's entitlement and his stupidity are really what end him. Here's how the king responds. Let's take a look at it. It says, hurry. Time out. Does anybody like to be told, hey, could you scurry along and do this quickly? Nobody does. Like the king is going to checkmate Haman so hard over the next couple of minutes that it is going to be unmistakable. Take the robes and the horse 
as you have said, he's basically turning this around on him. I didn't say this, you did. And do so to Mordecai the Jew who sits at the king's gate. Time out. That is the exact phrase that Haman has used to refer to Mordecai previously in this book. So the king is sitting there going, oh yeah, all that stuff, gosh, that's a great idea. Know that guy you hate? Why don't you go do that for him? He is just leveling Haman through this whole thing. And so as he walks through this, he says, leave out nothing that you have mentioned. So Haman, can you just imagine, this guy has no concept for humility and now is standing there having to go give the thing that he longs for most, which is what? Royalty, praise, and honor. And he has to give it to the guy who he would love to continue to see in sackcloth and ashes. So Haman took the robes and the horse and he dressed Mordecai and led him through the square of the city proclaiming it to him, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Uh, there's something beautiful in this and it's, it's this. I, I, I think that so many times we can take the story of Esther and we can really say to ourselves, I'm Mordecai. I'm Mordecai. So much wrong has been done to me. So many things have happened in my life. I'm part of God's people and I have been unjustly this and unjustly that. And what we don't realize is that so many times we are Haman. We are standing on what we have sort of justified or we've entitled ourselves to. We've declared rights and all these things that don't always fit. And that's what I wanna to submit to all of us today, myself included, is the fact that we can so many times get wrapped up in the fact that we are the godly character and we are God's people, but we are still prone to these ungodly behaviors. It's why the, the polarity of this story is so great because you have two characters and you kind of go, oh, good and evil. And we don't realize sometimes we're both. We're not always good. We are still prone to these moments where entitlement starts to take us over and we become entitled in times to relationships. We have these friendships where we sit back and, and we'll sort of sit there and say, I deserve. And when we don't get what we deserve, we start to pull back. We start to say, you know what? No, we're not, we're not gonna do that anymore. I'm removing my friendship because I didn't get what I deserved. Or what about our marriages? Oh, guys, this is the one where the Lord, the Lord uses my marriage and my children so many times to just break my heart. There's times where me and the Lord will be wrestling through a season. And again, I, I know the Bible fairly well. And so I'll sit back and I can do this. I can start to use the Bible. And I've talked about it before. I can weaponize the scriptures. So I start sitting there and, oh, Lord, this is, this is not good. And we're wrestling through stuff. And so, Lord, I just need you to deliver me. Would you change? And what do I say? Would you change my heart, Lord? Would you change my heart? And the Lord starts going to work and it's like, no, 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 that's wrong. That's not what I asked you to do. <laughs> change her, <laughs> change her. Give me a better circumstance. And all of a sudden the Lord keeps refining it to where like circumstances start to tighten in on you more and more. And this happens to me all the time. And I'm standing there and the Lord is boxing me in and pretty soon I can't move because what I'm asking the Lord to actually do is change her. Even though the Lord goes, no, I actually wanna make you okay and change your heart so that you're okay regardless of what your circumstances are. Let me worry about her. I'm gonna focus on you. That's what me and you will do. And the reality is, you know what I'm actually saying and how atrocious is this? The Lord does this to me a lot and this is what humbles me. I, I, get, I get Hamond all the time. It's just the worst because the Lord will come in and he'll go, hey, Rustin, I just want you to keep talking because I love to talk, right? You guys, why I'm up here, right? And I will sit there and I'll just keep talking and talking and talking. And pretty soon I get to the honest statement where I go, Lord, I want you to do it and I want you to do it my way. Oh no, what have I done? I am trying to dictate to you not only what I deserve, but how I deserve it. Lord, why am I doing this? And the Lord breaks me. I end up sitting there going, I, I see what I'm longing for the most. And I realize that I'm trying to manipulate the God of the universe to my will instead of me bending to his. And I think we do that. We become entitled to things. And, and this is really what's hard. Let's take a look at this real quick. It's the best definition I could think of for entitlement. As believers, we sit back and we try and church things up, but entitlement is clinging to promises that God never made. God never promised you that you would be happy he promised to make you holy. He promised to make you look more like him. And so many times in our lives, what we end up doing is we cling to these promises and then we try and find scriptures to support the things that we long for. And then we try to contort and manipulate the Lord back into our deal 
by using his holy scriptures to say, this is what I deserve. You said you'd be faithful to me. This is what I'm telling you your faithfulness looks like. And we'll talk about his faithfulness at the end of this sermon. I want us to move on. Uh, verses 12 and 13, I think are so great because Mordecai is, uh, is sitting there in the midst of this incredible moment and it says this. It says, then Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman hurried to his house. I love this role reversal. Mourning and with his head covered. Remember where we found Mordecai earlier in this book? He was in sackcloth and ashes. He was mourning. And the Lord just goes, I am going to completely, 100%, holistically reverse the circumstances from where Mordecai is in this place of mourning, the one who rightfully defended the king, not the one who is longing and desiring and deserving in his own right for the king's royalty, the one who really had no desire, no benefit for saving the king's life, he gets the honor. Like the Lord just works this thing out perfectly. And then it says this, and Haman goes home. Okay, so he heads to his house. And Haman told his wife Zeresh and all his friends everything that had happened to him. Then his wise men and his wife Zeresh said to him, if Mordecai, before, you have, before whom you have begun to fall, is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but you will fall before him. Let me add that to the list of things I wish I knew 45 minutes ago. Like, if I'm Haman right now, my jaw is on the ground going, guys, where was that? Like four hours ago, you looked at me and said, you know what you deserve? You know, you deserve to go run out and tell that king exactly what's up. Go tell him about this. Go get this. If, matter of fact, we'll build the gallows. You go talk to the king. Do you know why? Because Haman has surrounded himself with godless, characterless, moralless yes men. And do you know what yes men do? Yes men will tell you whatever is easiest for them. They will tell you what's convenient for them. They will sit back and they will look at you and go, ooh, man, you seem pretty pumped up right now. I don't think I really want to argue with you and I'm having a pretty good time sitting in your house drinking your wine. So I'm just going to sit here and tell you what you want to hear. And what you want to hear right now is that you're right, that you're deserving, and that you're entitled to something. So his whole group, just hours ago, in the middle of the night, after this party, sat there and said, yeah, dude, you should go. I'm not going to move, but let's see how that works out for you. Yes, men in our lives will do the same thing. For gals, you sit at a coffee. You sit there and they'll tell you, yeah, you know, I think your husband's an idiot. You should go home and tell him off. Oh, okay, well, let's try that out. Guys, we're no better. We sit back, you get with a buddy, what happens? Oh, man, she can't talk to you that way. Man, you go home and tell her what's up. That's bad advice, don't do that. But here's what godly counsel does. Godly counsel, which by the way, the scriptures talk about in abundance. It is a gift. It is a treasure. When you surround yourself with godly counsel, this scenario looks really different. Because godly counsel would have looked at Haman and godly counsel would have said this, hey, guess what? That's not a great idea. You're doing pretty good, Haman. Let's just recap real quick. You just came from a banquet where just you and the king and the king's wife hung out. That's a pretty special, pretty honored place you think we could just kind of call that the win? And just, let, let's, hey, let's hang out. Let's have a good night. Why don't we kind of let our heads clear and maybe we'll think about this whole, you know, let's go kill Mordecai thing in the morning. Can we put that on hold? But instead, they don't. It's the same thing. Godly counsel in your life sits down and goes, hey, before you go charging off to go blow up your parents or your friends or your spouse, before you make this rash decision because you're super mad at your boss, why don't we just come back and you know what? Nothing critical is gonna happen in the next seven days. Let's take a week. Let's pray about that. In fact, why don't we even fast and I'll join you because I love you. So I'd like to be in this with you. And let's see what the Lord does over a week of you giving your heart to him as well as your circumstances. And maybe if we get vertical on a solution, one will appear horizontally in our circumstances. That's godly counsel. Haman has none of that. And my challenge to all of us today is that we have to be willing to take a look at our own kind of circle of friends if we're really gonna continue to grow in the Lord. I think this last verse is great because if I'm Haman, I'm sitting there going, there's no way my day could get any worse than it already has, right? Well, let's see. So verse 14 says this, while they were yet talking with him, okay, 
The king's eunuchs arrived and hurried to bring Haman to the feast that Esther had prepared. Haman's sitting there going, I think we're doing pretty good. Okay, we've got it. This was bad. Tomorrow will be better. This feast is going to be kind of a stretching event for our friend Haman. And so this is not going to get any better for him. It is only headed downhill fast. So come back next week. I think Jamie is going to do a fantastic job with what I think is kind of the, the, the awesome, awesome picture of what happens in the book of Esther. But before we close, this is what I want to close around today, because you can't preach chapter six without talking about the faithfulness of God. But I have to be super careful in the way that we do this, because if I wanted to, I could take this chapter and go, listen, you're Mordecai. Don't worry. Help is on the way. You will be rescued. He is the deliverer. He is the savior. He will save you. God's not gonna let anything too bad happen to you because he's faithful. But here's the problem. That God, I don't think is a biblical one. Because that God that I just described will leave you in your perspective the second you get cancer. That God will not be there anymore the moment, God forbid, you lose a child. And I have friends who've done that. You see, the problem is if I paint God's faithfulness in the wrong light, in what I think is a false light, I will paint it in a way where you are sitting there and all of a sudden you're going, no, 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 this is gonna be fine. This is gonna be okay. He's right around the corner. He's coming. And the reality is God's plan leads us through painful places. Look at Esther. Look at Mordecai. They're God's people. And yes, deliverance came at the end. But one of the challenges that we have so many times is that we scope God's faithfulness into our desires. And sometimes that's not the path that his road takes. So I'm going to use a personal example, okay? I was recently cleaning out my garage. It's one of my least favorite things to do, but it always ends up yielding some sort of fruit. And so I found a time capsule. You guys ever do that? You open up a box and you're like, whoa, what is this? So here's what I found. This is a bulletin. Remember when bulletins look like this? Yeah, Jamie was preaching on, looks like Matthew chapter nine. Okay, this is from uh, September 13th of 2009. It's got a bunch of people in here that, you know, I don't recognize their names. It's got a bunch of buildings that don't exist anymore. And so it's kind of a funny thing. So this drew my attention, but here's what was super funny. I don't keep notes, okay? So for those of you who are excited because I'm about to hold up sermon notes, see, Rustin probably has a whole cabinet of sermon notes in his garage. Don't make me that guy. I'm not that guy, okay? These are sermon notes from 2008 from the Esther series that Jamie preached in. This was a really sweet moment for me because this is kind of what God's faithfulness looked like. This is from January 20th of 2008. I remember the season of life very well. I remember some of the prayers I was praying but I remember the mess that I was. I remember in, in 2008, I, I was a disaster. My marriage was a disaster. I found these notes sitting there, sweaty, dusty, pulled out a box of things. I, I have no idea why I even went through the box. I should have, and I mean, the first thing I found was an insurance policy from 2010. So I was like, well, we could trash this whole thing. But I started going through it. There was something in it just said, okay, let's go through the box. And when I found these, I just, I started to cry. I knew what the rest of our uh, series, the rest of our year was going to look like, and I knew where I was going to preach. And I picked these up, and I recognized this is what God's faithfulness looks like. Because the reality is this. I know this guy. I remember this guy. I've had to work with and counsel this guy for the last 11 years. And, and the reality is the Lord has had to break this guy so much. Like, you guys want the bad news? This is the improved version. Like, that's... <laughs> This is, this is where we landed. But what broke my heart was as I sat there and I was crying in my garage, looking at these notes, was that I was gonna stand in the same room that I took these notes on. I, 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 at this time in my life, I had a debilitating uh, alcohol dependency. I was a chronic alcoholic. Uh, evidently, while I was hungover, I took notes in church. I look at these <laughs> notes and I just go, my goodness, what, what were you thinking? But I looked at these and I went, man, I'm gonna stand in that same room, but I'm gonna preach in a series that I used to listen to. Uh, I looked at the, the name that was on him. It's uh, Jamie Rasmussen, senior pastor. And, and I remember marveling at this man, I still do. But I, I now, uh, I don't just call him pastor, I call him friend. And I get to do ministry alongside him. It's one of the great honors uh, of my career. I, I look at these notes and what I realize is that God's faithfulness did not look anything like my plan. 
God's faithfulness looked very different than I thought it would. If you'd have asked this guy in 2008 what his plan was, it was easy. Just money, fame. I want people to know who I am and I want to have a bunch of money. And had God given that to me, I can assure you it would have killed me. Like I wouldn't be here today. My marriage wouldn't exist. And the reality is that God's faithfulness was actually very, very painful. Because it's easy when you stand here today and you go, oh man, 11 years, Rustin, don't you see? The Lord has delivered you. Yeah, but had you checked in with me in like June of 2009 when I was actually trying to get sober and life was an absolute just disaster and I'd broken my wife's heart and I was hopelessly coming out of an addiction? That didn't look like God's faithfulness. But so many times in the midst of his plan, those most faithful moments where we are clinging to the fragments of our heart that say God is bigger than our circumstances, we have to be willing to sit there and say, I want something specific. I want his plan. I want what he has. And this is the deal. When we sit back and we talk about God's faithfulness, we have to be willing to look at it this way. Ask the question, why would anybody sign up for that? Here, here's the reality. Let's take a look at this. Here's what God's faithfulness looks like. God is faithful to his plan for your life, not to your desires. See, God's not faithful to the things that you want because if he gives you what you want, most of the things you want will hurt you. Most of the things that we want are based around what we think will give us what? Comfort, happiness. And the Lord goes, you may need to be uncomfortable to have best things. So when you ask that question, you say to yourself, well, who would sign up for that, Rustin? You're not painting a very rosy picture. Like, you're gonna clear this place out if you keep telling people that God's plan is pain and suffering. Because here's the deal. I got people coming to Christ every single year in these seats and the seats of every one of our multi-sites. Why? Because the other way isn't working. It's not delivering on their promises. The way of the world is delivering great. And, And guess what? People are checking the box. They're going, yep, I got all the money I need in a huge savings account. I got the beautiful wife or I got the great looking husband. I got the kids, I got the vacations and I'm still anxious and I'm still afraid and I don't have security. Why isn't it working? Because you will never be satisfied in the depths of your soul with anything other than God's plan for your life. And people who are sitting back with tons of money, tons of kids, tons of good looking stuff are sitting there saying, I'm still a mess. Why isn't it working? Because it's a hollow dream. It's a hollow place. And we're sitting back and those who have come to the Lord will tell you this, it ain't easy, but it's worth it. Because you know what I don't live in? I don't live in that hopelessness anymore because I'm putting my hope somewhere else. See, the reality is God never promised that we'd be happy but we'll experience joy along the way. He never promised to make us rich, but we might encounter some material possessions in this life. He never promised we'd have perfect kids, a perfect spouse, or a fantastic family of origin. What he promised is this. He promised he will never leave us, he will never forsake us, and that we will spend eternity with him. The problem that we have on earth is that so many times we try to flip those things around and we try and contort those two statements into some version of you owe me, Lord. You're lucky to have me on your team. Don't you see I'm gonna miss kind of the connecting the dots this month. I I need more, I need more. And you said you'd never leave me or forsake me. So you being here and you never forsaking me looks like I have what I want. And the Lord is sitting there going, no, 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 I love you, but I never promised you that. Here's one of the things, and this is where I wanna kind of close today. This is one of my favorite verses. I heard this last week. It says, therefore, it's out of 1 Peter 1, 13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, I love this phrase, set your hope, keyword, fully, fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You know what that verse doesn't say? Here's the deal. Think about your hope like a portfolio. Set a little bit aside in eternity, for kind of the rainy day or when it's all gonna come. And by the way, keep the rest of it right here on earth and invest some of it over here in your material things. Invest some of it in your marriage. Invest some of it in your kids. It doesn't mean that we don't experience joy around those things. It means this, and I say this a lot. Your hope is too heavy for the things of this world. If you place your hope on your money, it will crush it because it's too big. Because an eternal hope has been placed in each and every one of us. And when you take an eternal hope and you place it in a temporal realm, it is too heavy, it is too big, it is too expansive for for it to be supported here. 
If you take your eternal hope and you place it on your spouse, it will crush them. It is too big. They will let you down and they will feel your disappointment because you are taking an eternal hope and placing it on this temporal, finite being. That's why Peter's telling us, fully, take all of your hope, gather it up, find it in the little nooks and crannies of your life, bring it all into the living room and the home of your existence and place it in eternity. Give it to God. He is the only one who can steward it well. You see, the message of the faithfulness of God is he will be faithful to his plan for your life. You will be disappointed with anything else. And if you take your hope and you give it to him, you will never be disappointed because guess what? There is no entitlement. There is no right. We give up all rights in Christ. It is a place where you stand and when blessing comes your way, you just simply say thank you. And when difficulty comes your way, you continue to process it in godly counsel you stand back and you go, Lord, uh, this is, I have, I have kids, or I don't, but I call you good. That is where the Lord calls us. We're going to get to do something fun. I, I always say that I love, we get to have a time of reflection. And so when we have these times where we get to go to communion or to the elder fund, uh, I just love it because we get a time to take kind of some things that we've learned. And so today, whether you're sitting back and you're going, oh my gosh, I see these places where I'm Haman. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting and I'm entitled and I'm prideful and, and I'm, I'm, I'm expecting things of others or of God that, that he, he never promised me. Whether you're sitting back recognizing you don't have godly counsel in your life or, or whether you're sitting here today and you're going, oh my gosh, my hope is still here on earth in some places. Take this time that we're gonna come together now and just worship then give those things to the Lord. Spend some time just reflecting with him in prayer. Spend some time kind of worshiping with the words. We're gonna kind of dismiss in just a second so that our, our multi-sites, our campuses can have some time. But I just wanna encourage you today, the book of Esther's got so much to show us and it's when we identify with the characters who are struggling because at times we will struggle in life and the, the Lord of the universe is good. Jesus Christ is still in love with you and it'll all kind of work out because his plan works all things for the good of those who love him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the reality that we can continue to rely on you. We can come to you, Lord, in times of need. We just have to be willing to, to surrender our expectations. Expectations are so specific. And yet there's this reality that when we come to you, not with expectations that you'll do this or you'll do that, but we come to you with an expectant heart that you'll do something. When we give you an expectant heart, you can do so much with that. So Lord, our expectations are simply that you will continue to work all things for the good of those who love you, but we simply don't understand what your goodness looks like sometimes. So Lord, my prayer is for all of us as we surrender sometimes the toughest things, the blindness of our entitlements, Lord, my prayer is just that you would continue to work in our lives. We pray this in your name, amen.